Hello, everyone. Pastor Tony Denbach here. I'm the lead pastor of Clearview Community Church in Stainer. And today I'm coming to you from our Nottawa campus as we continue our series on the parables of Jesus. Today we're talking about grace. See, grace is just a word to many. And to others, there's a familiar song that says something about it. It's something that preachers talk about, but it's seldom seen. See, grace is kind of hard to live out and sometimes can be hard to understand. It's also the underlying theme for a number of Jesus' parables. Today, I'd like to share with you from one of Jesus' parables that is not often talked about. It's the parable of the workers in the vineyard, and is found in Matthew, the 20th chapter. It's a fairly long parable. It actually goes for the first 16 verses of the chapter. I'm not going to read it all for you today, but what I would encourage you to do is to grab a Bible and read it for yourself and take some time to think about what Jesus is teaching. To set the context for this parable, we look back to the previous chapter. Jesus had been speaking to the disciples about how difficult it was for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven because their identity was wrapped up in their wealth and they have a tendency to live for money the way that they should live for God. Jesus taught that the greatest commandment in all of Scripture was that we should love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In Matthew 19, verse 27, we read that Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? What was Peter expecting? See, in his mind, he was thinking that because they had chosen to follow Jesus and leave everything behind, Somehow that qualified them for a different level of heaven than others. After all, they had earned it, hadn't they? Jesus then goes on to say, basically, that all who follow him will find that God is faithful and will be rewarded far more than they could imagine. He then ends that chapter and introduces the parable with these words, but many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Now, with that in mind, we, we take a look at this parable. I'll read the first two verses, and then I'll illustrate the rest. Matthew 20, verses 1 and 2 say this, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. Now, a denarius was basically one day's wage in that day and age. Now, imagine that I'm a farmer like my grandfather was up on Poplar Side Road just outside of Collingwood. And I have a crop of tomatoes that's ready to be picked. And workers. At harvest time, you have no time to waste. So I'm out at 6 a.m. looking for people to help me collect my crop. I see an industrious guy who comes at first light because he just knows I'm going to be looking for someone. I negotiate with him, and I tell him that quitting time is 6 p.m., and I'll pay him $200 for his 12-hour day. He agrees, and off he goes to work. He works hard, too. At 9 a.m., I look up, and there's somebody else who looks like they're looking for work. I go and talk to them, and they agree to work for me. Quitting time is 6 p.m. He joins right in. And then something happens at 3 p.m. Somebody looking for work comes in, and I make and I send him out. Finally, at 5 p.m., here comes another guy ready to work. I tell him that quitting time is 6 p.m. Start picking. Here's your basket. Now, finally, at 6 o'clock, the whistle blows and the day is ended. The workers gather around for their pay. Now, who worked the hardest? We'll start with the guy who worked for 12 hours. Obviously, he gets $200. He's happy with that because that's good money for a picker. But then I proceed to the guy who started at nine. He worked three hours less than the first guy. I give him $20 too. I pat him on the shoulder and I say, well done. I go further down the line and to each one I give exactly the same amount of money. One worked 12 hours, one worked nine hours, one worked six, one worked three, and the last one only one hour. But each get the same payment. Is that fair? Now, some people listening are, are talking to their screens. No, it's not fair. They're ready to organize a union and demand their rights. But you see, this parable is designed to reveal a truth about the kingdom of God and to also reveal the truth about our hearts. You see, the reality is that for some, no matter how much we talk about grace, deep down somewhere, 
we still feel like we're piling up brownie points. And when it looks or feels like someone's cutting in line, that bothers us. You see, we think that life should be fair. This is the scandal of grace. And grace, very simply, is the unmerited favor of God. I think that's why so many good people have a really hard time with grace. The bottom line is that for some of us, we just don't think that it's fair. Here's where a lot of people are missing a very big point. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned. And Romans 6 and 23 says that the wages of sin is death. The bottom line is that in reality, none of us have actually earned anything. We couldn't. None of us deserves anything but death for the way that we have defied the God who made us. Each of us relies on the grace, the undeserved favor of God. Each of us are separated from God unless we take advantage of the ultimate price that Jesus paid for us on the cross. So when we get to the end of our lives, as followers of Jesus, and we cross death's threshold, each of us comes face to face with Jesus. And each of us who have come to know him inherits eternal life. Verse 16 concludes the parable with, so the last will be first, and the first will be last, the same way that Jesus began it. Now, like Jesus' other parables, there are different audiences who may take this different ways. For example, there's an application here for the nation of Israel as a whole. They were, after all, God's people. They were the children of Abraham. They were the ones through whom God had revealed himself and through whom Messiah came. Surely their place was special. Yet in the early days of the church, the good news of the gospel was received by the Gentiles too, the non-Jews, and they were called children of God as well. But they hadn't been raised on the Torah. They hadn't been keeping the law. They didn't even know the law. How was this fair? Well, the last will be first, and the first will be last. It also had an application for the disciples. Jesus had called them by name. They had left successful businesses and left home to follow him. They would each face horrible persecution and would die as martyrs for simply declaring the truth. They had been with Jesus since he started declaring the arrival of the kingdom of God. So later, some of these would have a hard time accepting Saul of Tarsus as one of their own, he had actually persecuted the church, and now God was making him a leader in it? What was that about? Well, the last will be first, and the first will be last. As Paul himself would say, he was the chief among sinners, yet God chose him. It also has an application for the church. Some of you have been in the church your entire life. You absorbed Jesus through the environment in which you were raised, and you've been a Christ follower for as long as you can remember. That's awesome. There are others who have come desperately to Jesus at the end of lives that have been spent running from God. Surely, if God is fair, that person would not be eligible to receive the same gift of eternal life as the one who has been faithful for decades, would they? Well, who said God was fair? See, God is just and justice required that someone pay the price for the sin that separated us from God. Jesus paid that price. He died for the faithful church attender. He died for the rebel teenager. He died for the self-sufficient businessman in the suburbs. He died for the thief on the cross. He died that we could live. He died that we could be forgiven. That wasn't fair. It's called grace. As Max Lucado writes, our Savior kneels down and gazes upon the darkest acts of our lives, but rather than recoil in horror, he reaches out in kindness and says, I can clean that if you want. And from the basin of his grace, he scoops a palm full of mercy and washes away our sin. So what is the lesson here? Well, don't play the comparison game. God is gracious to us far more than we deserve, each of us. We get into trouble when we think that we have earned some sort of special privilege because we've been so faithful. Focus on God and not your neighbor. Remember this, because it's true for all of us. He has not treated us as our sins deserve. Be grateful for the grace of God. Would you pray with me today? Dear God, we thank you for grace. 
which simply is the undeserved favor of God. You love us all, even though we don't deserve it. And your word tells us that if we come to you and if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In fact, your word tells us that if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation, the old has gone and the new has come. So you give us a chance to start over. So my prayer today is, first of all, for those who need a new beginning, for those who would come to you today and even where they are, would bow their heads and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Give me a brand new start. Help me to become your child. And you allow us to do that. You adopt us into your family. You make us a part of your kingdom. We thank you for that. But we also, God, pray for those who have been following you, but maybe have got to the point where they're feeling self-sufficient. They feel like they've earned something from you. When in reality, we're all just servants and you've given us far more than we deserve. So help us, Lord, to be grateful for the fact that we can know you, that we can walk in relationship with you, and that we can inherit eternal life because we do know you. We thank you for your grace, for your mercy in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So go out from here as workers in God's upside-down kingdom, where the last are first, and the first are last, where needs are met in miraculous ways, and there is grace enough for all. And may the blessing of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit surround you and sustain you in the coming days. God bless. Amen. Runs for cover when you move, no one's turned away. It's where you are, fear turns into praises. Where you are, no left unchanged So come move Let justice roll on like a river Let worship turn into revival Lord lead us back to you
more time. Justice roll out like a river, let worship turn into revival, Lord lead us back to you. There's no prison wall you can't break through, no mountain you can move, all things are possible, and there's no broken body you can't raise, no soul that you can't save, all things are possible. The darkest night, you can light it up, oh, you can light it up, oh, God of revival, let hope arise, death is overcome, you've already won. You're seated forever on the throne. So why should my heart fear what you defeated? I will trust in you alone. Cause there's no prison wall you can't break through. No mountain you can move are possible. Oh, there's no broken body you can raise, no soul that you can save. All things are possible. Stronghold will crumble. Hear the chains hit the ground. Oh, 
God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Come awaken your people, come awaken the city. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. I hear the chains here.
presence to cheer and to There's revival and it's spreading like a wildflower in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah, hell is lasting all week long. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of the gospel song. Won't you choose it? You can lose it. There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I've got a nose who's crying, singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation, and it's beautiful. I've got a heart overflowing. I'm very There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. When the valleys that I wander turn to mountains that I can't climb, you are with me, never leave me. Oh, there ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I got a note in this choir singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. Do you have something to share? Let everyone know about your next meeting, your need for volunteers, or your fundraising event on the Rogers TV Community Billboard. Send us your words and we'll bring them to life on Rogers TV and RogersTV.com. When it's time to spread the word, go to RogersTV.com to add your announcement to the Community Billboard. When you're online, Rogers TV on YouTube shares news and events from your community like messages from local leaders.